Shalom and good morning to one and all. Uh, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Okay, I believe that we still live in challenging time. We just received news of uh, one of our full-time workers, the whole family, all COVID-19. So now, today, they are all worshipping in Zoom. Uh, at different places, uh, we hear of uh, uh, people who are still, uh, you know, they, they use the word now called long covid uh, I only just recently <laughs> heard about this long COVID. In other words, we are in for the long haul for this. Huh? I remember this guy when we met together. Uh, this is a very special meeting and they were just sharing, in inverted commas, their COVID experience. <laughs> so this guy was saying, you know, you know, he got it before all the vaccination, etc. And he said, I was in the hospital and the whole family, all were hospitalized. But they all cleared out. I was the only one left. And uh, the doctors told me my oxygen level is so low that uh, they have to give away the oxygen tank because there were so many people. He said, left, right, all people dying. And so he said, uh, the doctor said, sorry, uh, we have to use this to give to someone else. And then he remembered. He said, but I trust in Jesus. So I, I remember this so clearly. Uh, Pastor, you, you, you told us, to call on his name, to call on his name, to call on his name. And that's what I did. For three days, I called on his name. I didn't have the intubator. I didn't have the oxygen, etc. But I called on Jesus. He was my oxygen. After the third day, the doctor said, what happened to you? I said, no, nothing happened to me. I don't need the oxygen now because I have the oxygen. And he was delivered. So that's what he said. You know, I was, because I didn't see him. I did see for two years, you know, two and a half years. And then he came and tells me the story. Well, except, of course, we're on phone. We prayed uh, for him and so on. And so uh, for me, actually, as I share this, uh, this morning's message, so for many of us, this lockdown, um, in some sense, it is a uh, close-up. But uh, I was asking different ones. I said, for you, what is the lockdown? And he said, lockdown is a release. And uh, I said, what do you mean? Well, when I'm discouraged, God is the one who encourages me. When I'm lacking, He's the one who provides. When I feel rejected, He's the one who tells me He cares for me and He loves me. And when I'm, uh, you know, all confused, He's the one who reveals His truth to me and help me to understand that the things that are happening, you know, God is in control. Hallelujah. He said that when I feel uh, doubt, in doubt, he gives me the assurance. Many times, I'm lost. I'm, I don't understand what's going on. But He is the one who guides me through and so on. And uh, others say that we feel very hopeless, we are fearful. He is the one who comes to uh, protect us and to help us understand that in Him there is hope. And more than anything else among them, I remember this guy said, well, for me, pandemic... Uh, it's not just only a lockdown. For me, it's grief and death. And I said, so what happened? And then they told us our family members had passed away. We, didn't, we couldn't even attend the funeral. And said, it was so frustrating. But you know, this is the verse that helped me to understand that we know all things God works for good to those who love Him and to those who have been called according to His purpose. And I pray that this will be so for you, even as we know that, as we think about Pentecost, the disciples were also going through uh, a kind of a pandemic. <laughs> because, uh, uh, why do I say that? Because the, their pandemic was different. Uh, so they couldn't understand many things. And the amazing missionary Hudson Taylor, those of you who have heard about him, you can Google his name, this is what he said. He went through a lot, actually, on the field. And he said this, All our difficulties are only platforms for the manifestation of His grace, of His power and His love. And I pray that you begin to understand how these things will work it out. And so as we draw near to uh, so-called celebration of Pentecost, we are reminded in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. I'm going to read some portions of it. If you can turn your Bible to Acts chapter 1, and I will read from verse 1 to verse 8 first, and then I will read chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. In the former book, Theophilus, I wrote all about 
what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Verse 3. After this suffering, after his suffering, he showed himself to all these people and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Verse 4. On one occasion, while he was sitting, eating with them, and he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Verse 8, and this verse, I trust that you will memorize it. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. What happened? Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, 120 of them. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire and that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So this was what happened when the, at Pentecost. And uh, a lot of times we read, it is in the book of Acts of the Apostles. Really, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Apostles. That you remove the Holy Spirit, there is no Acts of the Apostles. Okay, so let's be very clear about that. It was a very uh, amazing point for the disciples, even as we read this. So this verse, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in all the places to the ends of the earth. And I pray that even as you look at this, and next week when you think about Pentecost, remember, there are three things that are mentioned here before you can go places. You must receive the power. Number two, it is the Holy Spirit who gives the power. And number three, it is meant for you to be witnesses. So if we can understand that, then for us to be a witness, it must be that we go places. Hallelujah. So as we read this, it is actually consistent with Jesus' great commission. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them everything I've taught you so that you remember that this is what will happen even as you're being used. So as we think about this, let me just come to this point, the first point that I want to share with you. You know, as being a witness, what are the requirements? It's a requirement of preparation. Okay? So, there is a need for us to be prepared to understand what it means to be a witness. Okay? So, as we look at this, the disciples spent three and a half years with Jesus. They saw amazing things. They heard amazing things. They did amazing things. And if at all any one of us being with Jesus would be, that's what it would be. But you know, Jesus started by calling them first. When he prepared them, he called them. So in Mark chapter 3, in the very beginning, Jesus called them to the 12. And then what was the key about that? He called them to be with him. And I think that's very important for us to understand. They will be with him for three and a half years. And for the three and a half years, they're going to be with Jesus. They're going to be disciples, to be trained. They're, Jesus was going to prepare them for the things that are ahead. Until Pentecost, something is going to happen. But you see, in this phase one of, uh, of uh, coming to know Jesus, following Jesus, etc., we read very clearly that he, there was a developing a growing relationship with him. They begin to remember what he has done, etc. And at one point, Jesus even asked them, you know, what do you think? Who, who do you think I am? 
Yeah, he had to reassure them, but he also had to reaffirm them. He had also to question and challenge them whether they really understood his mission coming on earth. And so if we can understand this, then this relationship begins to grow. But you know, the last week of Jesus' life on earth really bowled him over. All right, Beginning with the week concerning asking them to follow him, and so they followed him three and a half years. As they followed him, they, whatever that happened, they could observe, they could see, and so on. But the, the last week of Jesus' life, everything was so confusing in many, in many sense. He came into Jerusalem, be, declared as a king, declared as the one who will save them. And then, but even though Jesus told them that they will, he will be arrested, he will be tried, he will be punished, he will, be, uh, 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 he will suffer, he will die on the cross, on the third day, he will rise from the dead. You know, all this didn't matter to them at that point. And I want to say to you, for three and a half years following Jesus, in this phase one of their life, etc., following Jesus, we read so clearly that, you know, in the phase two, they betrayed Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus. Phase two, they ran away when he was arrested. In in Matthew 26, 56, they, all of them ran away except John who was there. And then when Jesus told Peter, you're going to do the same thing, he said, no, 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 I won't do that. I will always be, I'll go even to prison. You know, that's, that's Peter and many of us have that Peter spirit too. Okay, so yeah, we'll do it. So I'm very gung-ho. Huh? So, but you know, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, you read in, um, I think it is in Luke chapter 23, uh, where it says, uh, in verse 49, it says that they stood afar off. It was hard to identify with Jesus. Yeah, they stood afar off. But that's phase one of three and a half years climaxing into the death of Jesus. Then we read also that Jesus told them ahead of time, I will be the resurrection and the life. Jesus told them ahead of time that all those who believe in him, they will not die even though they live. It's not even though they will not die even though they will die physically because they will live forever. And he says, do you believe this? So this was preparation for them, for them to understand that Jesus is going to be risen from the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And so they witnessed all that. But I want to tell you, the scripture records for us very clearly concerning what, what happened to them when they received the news. In Mark chapter 16, verse 11, when the, when the ladies came and told, you know, yes, we, we have seen Jesus, we have seen, seen him, they would not believe it. Huh? In Luke chapter 24, verse 10, 11, when the ladies came, said the apostles, when they heard the women said, they didn't believe in the women. Because their words seem to them like nonsense. Thank God, uh, Jesus revealed to women first before he revealed to men because men cannot believe all the time. Huh? Okay. And then they, there was these two guys on the road to Emmaus. You know, they, they, were, they didn't recognize Jesus. But you read in chapter 24. Then when Jesus broke bread, because Jesus spoke to them about the scriptures, about himself and so on. And then, then when he broke bread, they realized it was Jesus. And their eyes were open and their hearts were warm. And, but they, Jesus disappeared. And then they ran back to Jerusalem and said, yes, 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 we've seen the Lord. But they also did not believe. Yeah. So it's not so easy. Three and a half years with Jesus still cannot believe. Huh? You would say, how can they are like that? But many of us go through that kind of situation. And this guy who had been with Jesus also, and then some of them have already seen Jesus. You know who I'm talking about. And Thomas, he said, until I put my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand inside, I will never believe. That's how, how it is. Huh? But are we criticizing? Are we judging? Them? No, because we go through these periods of unbelief. Whether it's about healing, whether it's about God doing miracles, whether it's God giving a word to us, the Holy Spirit giving us a word, we do not believe. There is a lot of unbelief. And we need to actually bring down that wall of unbelief. And so Jesus, but Jesus was so gracious, right? Jesus assured them again and again. And so for 40 days, we just read this down. Jesus 
proved to them that he's alive. He showed them, all right? If you read in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he's, he met up with almost 500 people besides the apostles and so on. And what did he do, all right? He did a revision course about the kingdom of God. Right? In chapter, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he, he told them about the kingdom of God. And I like Acts. It begins with the kingdom of God. It also ends with the kingdom of God in chapter 28, verse 31. But, you know, as, we, as he began to tell them, look, didn't I tell you all this? Didn't I tell you all this? It's almost like uh, telling them that they have forgotten. But why have they forgotten? What happened? Why have they forgotten? Uh, they've forgotten because they were almost uh, captured by the events of the day, all right? So Jesus had to open your minds. Jesus had to cause your hearts to be stirred again uh, to understand that his mission didn't just end at the cross. Neither his mission just end at the resurrection. He restored their confidence. Whom did he restore? Thomas, my God, my Lord, my God, because he wanted Thomas. If you were Thomas, I wouldn't. I, I, I was just thinking... I already said I would never believe. Then Jesus appeared. I wouldn't even dare to go and touch him. I would just acknowledge who he is. All right? Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus didn't say when he met him, he said, I told you so. No, he didn't. <laughs> All Jesus did was to say, what did he say? Do you love me? In other words, when you denied me, you didn't love me. When you denied me, you didn't even consider all that I have done. But it's okay. Jesus assured them, restored their confidence and brought them to a point. Even if you say, if you don't love me, now I'm asking you, do you love me? And in a sense, this morning, Jesus is asking us, really, where is your allegiance? We just saying, Jesus is the center of our life. And is it true? Is it really true? Even in our thought pattern, in our heart, in the things that we do. So we need to ask again. Jesus asked them. And because he asked them, he asked him, what happened? Then he said, Peter, this is, there is work to do. All right, Jesus accepted him for all whatever that he has uh, denied and, de and, and done. So he reminded them also, we read just now, the, the Holy Spirit. This was in preparation for the things that are going to come at the day of Pentecost. And so he reminded them to wait. He reminded them to, uh, that the Holy Spirit is a gift that they, they will receive. And they're gonna, something amazing is going to happen. And so in the 10 days that they were waiting, they did three things. Uh, they did two, two main things. But, uh, so one is they prayed together. They spent time waiting. Number two, they were all in Jerusalem. All right? And then they dealt with, I always say, the spirit of betrayal. Because somebody needs to be replaced. Uh, replaced at the, uh, the, the place of Judas. And so here they must be rid of all the betrayal and the denial in which Jesus uh, already restored them, but they were spending time just waiting in worship and so on. The preparation for readiness to be His witness. Because they were told already, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the, uh, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, you will receive power and you'll be my witness. What does that mean? What does that entail? Well, we know that even as that happened, Okay, so with the preparation, there is also being a witness. They were preparing themselves. Jesus was preparing them to be witnesses. But, you know, in the sense they fail. Like somebody said, it's good to fail. Because when you fail, you realize that you need to do something about it. And so the promise was given. As the promise was given, they realized that it is a fulfillment of Scripture. Uh, as what Jesus had said. And so if you actually read in... Uh, in the promise that was given, this was actually a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, given in chapter 2, verse 27, 28, which, which Peter actually in his sermon preached on that. All right? And he says that this, was, this is, for now, the Holy Spirit will be on all people. Hallelujah. And there's a reason for it. Because when it is on all people, then there will be a movement that God is going to do even in the days ahead. When Jesus came, he shared and said that the kingdom of heaven is, uh, has come. But now there's going to be a movement. And this movement is going to be what it will be uh, uh, that will touch even uh, like to the ends of the earth. Huh? So that promise was given. And then when that promise was given, we know that the Holy Spirit came in an amazing way. 
for them. So the amazing thing is about this promise given is that when the Holy Spirit came, we read just now, they could hear it, okay, the sound. They could see it because they saw the tongues of fire. And they could not only do it, they could also speak it. So these were in fulfillment of scriptures which Jesus said, when these things are going to happen, all right, you not only are going to have the power to do what he has given the disciples to do. So there was a sound, there was a dramatic sound. There was a dramatic sight which he experienced. And there was also the dramatic speech that touched so many people, even in their lives and so on. So the amazing counter uh, with, the, with the Holy Spirit from that on helped them to realize that this is the thing that Jesus is talking about. This is the event that Jesus is talking about. And Pentecost, actually, the, the, the Jews also celebrate Pentecost. But it is the end of 50 days of harvest, the first fruits they offer. And uh, in another, uh, in another uh, understanding, it's about the, word, the, the Ten Commandments given to the people of God from Mount Sinai. But whatever it is, this was something that dramatic that Jesus was going to uh, as promise them and this happened. Okay? And then he says, you shall receive power. What is this power? Well, it is a power to be witnesses. Without this power, they, they cannot be witnessed. They begin to be bold and courageous. And a lot of them, the people were utterly amazed. You know, when they begin to speak in tongues, there was something like we recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. There are 16 different groups of people from all over Asia Minor. They were there. They spoke their own language, even though they are Jews and so on. But the Arabs were there too. And then they understood when these people who are Galileans, who did not know many uh, uh, different languages, but when they spoke, the people understood. There is a reason for it. Because it is really an amazing thing that they had experienced with Jesus said they will speak in tongues. All right? In Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Uh, and so as we begin to understand that, something happened. Because uh, Peter, uh, when he received this, he had the power to speak the word of God. He had the power to preach, which he would be not be able to do so having denied Jesus. He would not be able to do so. How would he know how to say all these things? But you know, the amazing sermon was just simply, it touched all the nations there, those who understood it. They were all spirit-filled. The power and the message of Peter came in such great, amazing way. For 3,000 uh, people who repented and when they were cut to the heart, the, the Bible tells us that they say, what do we do? And he says, repent, you know, and receive the forgiveness of sin. And then you will also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There was a conviction of hearts and so on. And so there was such a release. If you remember, Jesus said, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. You know, when they, when the context of it is that they caught a lot of fish at that time. Now this is something that is beyond them. They saw so many people coming to know the Lord. They began to be Jesus' witnesses in power. We also know that uh, even as we talk about healing, besides the power, there was personal transformation for each and every one of them. And uh, Paul says like this, when we have been touched and we know who Jesus is in our life, it is we are a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared. The new way of living has come into existence. And so, as if there was something fresh and new in their lives with the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit upon them. And so, even as they begin to understand this, more and more, they became more Christ-like. Who are these people? How come? And that's why they were called Christians. Because they, they, they knew that these are the people who followed Jesus. Hallelujah. So, and so, what happened? As they begin to preach, as they begin to proclaim, then something was, was uh, uh, very blasphemous for, for the Jews. And what did they say? You know, you've got to stop doing this. They said, you cannot continue like this. All right? You cannot speak about the name of Jesus. But what, was, what did they say? We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Is that your experience and my experience? We have God's story, you know. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Another place they were told, stop all your, your preaching about Jesus. We are witnesses of these things. Is that you being a witness 
that can bear the testimony and so on. Okay, so as we begin to look into this, now I think it's working a little bit better. <laughs> okay, what was the secret? The secret is that, that these men have been with Jesus. That's the secret. And that's the connection we continue to have all the time. I pray that even as they have been with Jesus three and a half years, but they seem to have failed. But with the Pentecost, now that's why Jesus said, you know, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not come. Now the Holy Spirit has come. He's in you, with you forever. He's the one who will guide you, will teach you, will convict you, who will show you all the things that, will, that, that they're supposed to see from what Jesus had taught them and so on. And so when, this, this, when the power to heal, when this man at the gate, beautiful, the beggar was raised to, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to wholeness, he could jump around and so on. And they were being accused of doing something that was terrible. But you know, instead of praising God, but then they could answer, it is because of Jesus. And they noticed that these men had been with Jesus. That's a secret. They've been with Jesus. And because they've been with Jesus, you know, just like what Martin Luther said, every day is Jesus. Jesus was, it seems like we need to live and preach Jesus like as though he was crucified yesterday, rose from the dead today, and is returning tomorrow. Come on. Are you urgent about it? Right? You need to be urgent about what, what uh, Jesus was imparting through the Holy Spirit to all his disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you are going to live every day for me. You're going to be witnesses. Everybody is going to ask who you are. You know, it was interesting that in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, when, they, when many things were happening during that time, and then they were coming to look for Paul and Silas, and they couldn't find him. And he says, where are these men who have turned the world upside down? <laughs> okay, uh, we don't want to do something like that, upside down, uh, cause people, but we want to see change. We want to see a move of the Spirit that will be in the lives of people. And we're beginning to see that. How many of you think that pandemic is good? None of you will say it's good. But I want to say pandemic is good for the kingdom of God. Why? Because what can never happen in the early days, now people are online. Okay. Now people who cannot come to church are online. Not because they, they are sick or so on. They cannot come to church. If they are found in church, it will be a problem. But they are online. I met this guy who says, I've been attending church. I said, how? He said, I said, pandemic, MCO. He said, oh, then he told me. He said, that's why I want to see you. I said, okay, what do you want to see me? I have many questions. So he started asking. So by the second session that I had with him, he said, okay, there's no reason for me not following Jesus. And he's not the only one. There are many more. All right? So whatever you say about pandemic, I want to say to you that God has turned around. God has turned around for the disciples. They had greater boldness to speak. You know, and they say we must, we, we, he says it like this, when they are told, you cannot speak about Jesus, he said, now Lord, they prayed, consider their threats, enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Where was Peter when he denied Jesus? Where was Thomas when he said, no, I doubt? And where were the others who all ran away? Now they are asking, help us to speak with great boldness. And so we read also, and every day in the temple from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as a Christ. And so this, as a proclaiming, uh, they, they were proclaiming the name of Jesus all the time because of the closeness they have received and the relationship. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, how is it possible? Jesus is no more with them. But you know, the Spirit of God is with them, all right? You will bear fruit, much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And they realized that. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they can do things that was even more, greater than, just like your team says, you know, amazing things. He's going to do great things. You believe that? If you believe that, then this is the secret of it, being abiding in His presence. And He in us and we in Him. Besides that, 
what was the greatest testimony that Jesus said would happen? He says, you need to love one another. Because by this, all men will know that you are truly my witnesses. All men will know that you are following me. That all men will know that there is hope in, 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 in the group that they see. And they will join in the group. Because this is what, what happened in their lives. Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, they lived together and they had goodwill, you know, with those outside and those inside together. And then the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 4, verse 47, chapter 2, verse 47, daily the Lord added into their midst those who are being saved. Why? Because it's a powerful testimony of living in the love of God. And so that's why they were obedient as sheep. My sheep, they hear my voice, Jesus said. You know, and they know me and I know them and they will follow me and I give to them this amazing life which people would need to know, which, needed, uh, which people would need to have. And, and they, are, they are eternally with me. You know, and even as people begin to see your outlook, your understanding of what's happening around you will change. And so pandemic is release. Pandemic is opportunity. Pandemic is a release of people from their bondages. And so uh, we just receive a, a prayer, a thanksgiving to say that those people in Myanmar, uh, there are people asking questions and asking the Christians to come into the mosque, asking the Christians to come to the temples, asking the, peop- the Christians to come and tell them how to live this pandemic and know Jesus. This is happening right now in Myanmar. And so I just want to encourage you to just say that, yeah, God, you are doing amazing things, all right? And because He's doing amazing, amazing things, all the more we need to live wisely. All the more we need, need to live purposefully. You know, Paul told the Ephesians, remember, you need to walk worthy of the calling they receive. How do you do that? By living carefully. Because if you live carefully, there, there's every opportunity that is available for you because the days that are, they are changing, it is evil. The days that are changing, that will bring greater hardship. The days that are changing, they will cause you even greater concern and worries. You know, uh, whether we look at the world all the time, yeah, it is very dismal. People uh, who have friends in uh, Sri Lanka, we're telling we're in a, such a terrible situation right now. We read of pastors in Ukraine who say we decided to stay on because we need to minister to the people there. There are things that are happening all around, but we live as witnesses. Hallelujah. If we live as witnesses, then we live being filled with the love of Christ. All right? Live a life in chapter uh, 5, verse 1 and 2. It says that we need to follow the example of Christ. And when we live like this, we follow the example of Christ, then we live as children of light. We're not in darkness. Witnesses means that we are living even though all around darkness. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Why? Because we follow him in in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says that, you know, I'm the light of the world. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Imagine that. That's what being a witness is all about. Being the light of life. Bringing light to darkness. Bringing light to the darkness of different people in, in grief, in death, in hopelessness. That's what we're asked to do. You shall receive power to be witnesses. You shall proclaim this name, Jesus, because you are proclaimed as my witness. So you live, you proclaim in word, you proclaim in life, you proclaim in deeds, as God will work on in, in, uh, bringing that transformation. Live as children of light. Find out what pleases the Lord. That's what Paul says. And then you will be doing what Acts one eight says. You will receive power to be witnesses. You will receive the message that you can proclaim. Alright? But we don't just, yeah, yes, I've come to know Jesus. But it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, how do we maintain this connection? How do we maintain to enable people to see that, yes, we are still witnesses 24-7. 
Hallelujah. We are witnesses because we continue to follow him. We don't just follow him when, 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 when it's good, when, the, the, when things are happening, or we don't just follow him when things are not good. And so we say, oh, Lord, I'm desperate. Just like this person said, yeah, my neighbor, some years ago, he's gone to be with the Lord. My neighbor, you know, I shared with him, I said, you come to know Jesus. Said, oh, you know, you, you know, I did scripture when I was a student, you know, and I got A for scripture. You don't, you don't need to tell me about that. He said, you know, again and again. But, you know, one day when he had to go to the hospital, there's nobody to fetch him. I fetched him to the hospital. He was lying there. He was groaning away. He grabbed my hand and said, you know, uh, he calls me Sing Tiong. He said, Sing Tiong, you know, um, when, when I'm well, I'll come to church. I said, oh, when you're well, you come to church. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, so as he held my hand, suddenly one of my ex-students came, oh, he was a doctor, and they said, Mr. Paul, what happened? Your, your father? I said, no, no, my neighbor. And so as he held it, wow, how come you got so many contacts everywhere? I said, no, it's not. This, this is the beginning of new stories that's going to come in your life. Finally, he came to know the Lord. Finally, you know, when he, he, he passed away, actually he passed away in his sleep, and he told his son, he said, when that happens, just tell Pua, he knows what to do. Oh, as though I know what to do. Huh? Okay. <laughs> and I was in school that time. I was the principal of the, and the first school there in Sri Santosa. And, and the son said, Pua, uh, Mr. Pua, my father said, when he's gone, just tell Pua, he would know what to do. But you know, that was such a witness because he continued to follow him and there was a, a witness of his life that we could actually share about. And not only that, but it's the, the chapter 2 is the, the, the wife. The wife refused to come to our house whenever we have function and so on. He, he just said, okay, let them all go. But you know, one day, across the fence, he was, he saw, she saw my wife and she was doing something. He said, I see, this Sunday I want to come to church. Wow. I said, that was after the funeral. <laughs> and why? And she came to know the, the Lord also. See, what I'm trying to tell you is that when you continue to follow Him, you will be strengthened in your faith. And not only that, you'll be filled with thankfulness. There's something that will change in your life. And even as you are set apart to do what God uh, has asked you to do, to be holy as I am holy. You know, we, we, we are people that, that will reflect who He is again and again. I pray that this will be so. And Paul says, you know, you become the fragrance. You become the aroma. You know, wow. Uh, when the, if, if I bring any other drink here, you won't smell. But if I bring a hot brewing coffee, the whole hall will smell of the aroma. And I pray that this will be so for us. And that's why Paul says, you know, to, to, uh, to the perishing, you know, we, we smell, uh, we, we are the aroma of Christ. But we smell the, uh, of death because we have died. That what, who is alive in us? That's a fragrance of Christ in us. I pray that this will be so even as we understand this more and more, as we proclaim it. You may sense your, your life, you know, I don't have much, but Martin Luther says, God can use anyone. He can use a crooked stick to draw a straight line. And I believe so. Yeah, you may have all your... I, I like this guy, he said, uh, you know, I remember he, he was preaching in our church many years ago. He's gone to be with the Lord. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. He's Dr. Colton. He says, you know, he, he also exercised the gift of healing. He said, God is going to heal you. But I want to tell you, huh, I'm a bundle of medical problems. I got, I got uh, uh, ulcer, I have heart problem, you know, I have breathlessness. But when I'm preaching here, God is going to bring healing. Right? That's how he, he said. So when I thought of that, he said, yeah, God can use a crooked stick to draw a straight line. And God can use you even in the midst of your own illness and so on. And so I want to say to you, this is the encouragement we have being a witness. Mother Teresa, she works among the marginalized and so on. But you know, when she was told, wow, you're such a lady, you're so amazing, so on, she only says, I have only two words, Jesus Christ. And then this is what she said, you know, we are all like a pencil. I'm, I'm like a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world, being a witness. Huh? And then he does the writing, the pencil has nothing to do with it. And I think that all of us, as we serve the Lord as witnesses, 
You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness. And so Mother Teresa was that witness uh, to the marginalized, to those who cannot help themselves at all. So never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. As you begin to do this, you begin to realize that being a witness is for Jesus to open opportunities for you to do what he wants you to do. I like this. The name of this church is the Acts 29 Church. I will tell you why. Because I asked him, why Acts 29? Acts has got only 28 chapters. He said, yeah, because it, it is not finished. If you read verse 31, he says, boldly, Paul continued to witness and he was teaching about the kingdom of God. And, he, and it's not finished yet. Acts, so we are Acts 29. We want to continue and finish this and see the closure that this message will bring. All right? So even as we talk about preparation, even as we talk about promise, even as we talk about power to be witness, even as we proclaim the name of Jesus, the, the, it seems like the most effective way, and we're not asking for it, but we read in Acts, it must be, so it is also persecution. Yeah, persecution will come in, in different forms. But this was what they experienced. Because if you, if you read, Jesus told them already. He says, it's going to happen. This is going to come in, in so many ways. And you're going to understand that this persecution will come because the world hates me. And that's why because the world hates me, then they will hate you also. And, but it's not because of hate, but because they'll be against what you have come into your, into your what, uh, the power that God has given to you. All right? And so the first experience they had was this. When they were told, uh, flock, they were flock, uh, they were beaten up, beaten up, and they said, they, were, they counted, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That was their first experience. They were beaten and they came out. And what was their response? Daily they went from house to house in the temple court. They never stopped speaking and preaching about Jesus and so on. So they counted worthy to suffer for the Lord. And Paul says like this, I have gone through it all. I've gone through the whole works of it. And indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he told Timothy, will be persecuted. Not that we ask for persecution, but when it comes, are we prepared as witnesses to be in suffering for the Lord and so on. And I want to just uh, ask that you begin to understand why Peter wrote these words. When Peter denied Jesus, Jesus said, Come, do you, do you love me? He said, yes, I love you. Then feed my lambs, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, etc. And then, then Peter wrote these two epistles to the people who are going to go through suffering. And he says like this, all of us are called and called to be witnesses. Called to be what? To be like Jesus who suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Yeah, some in greater degree than others. But I want to say to you, whatever it is, it is following Jesus and looking for his steps, even as he would do so. And so, even as we begin to understand this, I want to share with you about this man. Some years ago, he came to Malaysia. He went to prison for many, many years, huh? beaten up, his legs were smashed. He's called a heavenly man, okay? And Brother Yoon, when he, his legs were smashed and so on, he had to... He had to put up his leg in the prison, you know. And because if not, it would be so painful. But he, he knew, he fasted so many days. I read it in the heavenly book, uh, the heavenly man, the book. Huh? But what I want to try to tell you is that one day, in a dramatic way, the Lord told him, now is the day of your freedom. He said, I can't even stand. But when he got down, he could stand. Then the, the, the prison gate opened. The prison door, the, the cell door opened. Then he passed by. The, the guards didn't see him. He went, he saw the, the, the gates open, he went out, and there was a taxi waiting for him and took him. All right? So that's a, that's a kind of guy who has this, uh, you call it adventure. I don't know about adventure, but you know, uh, he was, he's a very timid person. When, he, when he, there was a huge crowd, and I, I remember going to talk to him, I said, you know, just, just share, just ask him how, how he felt about all this. He said, oh, I'm afraid of crowds. He said, 
you know. But uh, but he once he get onto the pulpit, he's like a lion. Huh? Okay, so he says like this. Somebody asks him, "What is the what is your understanding about you going to prison and now being used by the Lord?" And he says, "It is not great men who change the world, but weak men in the hands of a great God." Hallelujah. And I pray that you can understand this. All right. He went through all that and he understood this. But I want to say, say to you, here was another man who served India 32 years as an Australian missionary over in Odisha. And what did they do? They helped lepers. People who uh, were ostracized like in the days of Jesus and so on. He, they, helped, they really held them. They loved them and cared for them. But the Hindu extremists didn't appreciate that. And so one day, they were, he was in his jeep together with his two sons and they were burned to death. You know, uh, if you remember in 1999, uh, this came out in the papers and so on. And so what happened? When they were, they, even when they tried to come out, they were pushed into the, to the fire and so on. There is actually a film done on this uh, called The Least of These. But what Gladys the wife, being a witness for Jesus in persecution before the whole audience in, with TV all beaming, he said, I hold no grudge against those who did this to my husband. Really, forgiveness will bring healing. And she said this with all tears in her eyes. What happened to the disciples? They were persecuted. The first person to be persecuted was Stephen. And Stephen even said the same thing. Forgive them, Lord. They do not know what they're doing. And from then on, in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, somebody uh, glibly said like this, if you don't follow Acts chapter 1 verse 8, God will give you Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And, <laughs> and that's persecution. Huh? Okay. Uh, because that's when, but then in verse 4 of chapter 8, it says that everywhere they went, they were scattered. Huh? They preach the word. They don't want to go, no? They don't want to go out. So I'm not saying, I don't know about what Pastor Albert will tell you uh, next week. But I, I said, no, uh, we, we finish here, we go out, we tell our stories. Huh? Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, you are now more familiar with this. It's a good friend of mine. We work together. We work among people who are prevented from coming to know Jesus. Where is he today? We had talked about this before. And he says, when it comes a time, God knows his purpose will never be thwarted. Who would know the pandemic will bring in so many more into his kingdom? Who would know the pandemic will allow so many of them to attend church? If Pastor Peter, Pastor uh, Raymond uh, knows about this, he will be so delighted of what has happened. So let's live our life all the time as, a, as an offering to the Lord. Jim Elliot was also killed in the process of reaching out to a Wadani people. Said this in his journal, even before he was appointed as a missionary. Right? He's no fool. He puts it in what Jesus would say, if you keep your life, you lose it. If you give your life, you, uh, you will find it. So he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Your life is in God's hand. The next verse always helps me to understand. When we are in, in situation where we do not understand, I will tell you, we live, we live for him. We die, we die for him. Whether we die or live, we belong to the Lord. So, where is Pastor Raymond? I don't know, but he belongs to the Lord. Where is uh, uh, Graham Stain Stewart, the one who uh, was burned alive with his two children? I don't know. He's with the Lord. He belongs to the Lord. And that's why we, we have an identity. We are people belonging to God. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We are not only a holy nation, we are people belonging to God. And so if we continue to live as a witness. Daniel was a witness of the power of God. Right? And when he was in the lion's den, we know that nothing happened because he was faithful, obedient witness. 
And that's why he could say this writing in the prophetic words that those people who know their God, those people who are empowered by God, those people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, those people who know that they can be witnesses in, through thick and thin to different situations, they will carry out great exploits. Wow. And that's, that's for us to do, but not because we are, we are strong. It says, shall be strong means you'll be made strong. Shall be strong means you'll be strengthened. Shall be strong means that you can be weak. And Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. He says, I ask the Lord, what is happening to me? Why do I have this thorn in the flesh? I didn't get any answer. The answer I received in verse 9 of chapter 12, 2 Corinthians. My grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. That's what, that's what God wants to do continuously, even as we live lives as witnesses. You know, as we, we receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, we also receive the power to do what He asks us to do. We need a breakthrough. But the breakthrough comes when we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. The breakthrough comes when we understand that we will be witnesses through thick and thin, through good weather and bad weather, through situations we will never be in control because we belong to the Lord. And this is what true worship is all about. This is your true and proper worship. That's what Paul says. As I go through this, I begin to understand that when, even when I'm, I'm hard-pressed, I'm not crushed. Even when I'm perplexed, I know that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not confused. I'm not abandoned. I'm persecuted, but I'm not abandoned. I'm, I, even when I'm struck down, I'm not destroyed. And that's why we live for Him as witnesses. And so the key thing for in Acts, when Pentecost took place, it is to prepare them for the days ahead because persecution will come. Many of them will be taken in. Many of them would not have a, a, a kind of a easy life as they, they were in Jerusalem. But you know, as we, we come to this point, I want to say to you, where are you in relation to the Holy Spirit being given to us? Not just to experience amazing presence, which is also, which is amazing, but really just like Jesus, calling the disciples to be with him. To do what? So that he might send them out to preach. So that he might give them the authority to cast out demons. And you and I have that privilege to be that witness. And as I close on to this point, I want to just uh, read something that uh, John Stott, a man who was a great preacher and writer, as well as a good Bible expositor. This is what he said of, in his introduction to his book on the book of Acts, which he wrote a commentary. Without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be impossible. There can be no life without the life giver. No understanding without the spirit of truth. No fellowship without the unity of the spirit. No Christ-likeness in character apart from his spirit. The fruit of the spirit. No effective witness without his power. As a body without breath is a corpse. The church without the spirit is dead. I ask, your life is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you alive or are you dead? Are you half dead or half alive? The disciples had to take up the challenge and know that this is the time. And I want to say, like Haggai says, consider your ways. Being witnesses for him. One day, Jesus with his disciples, somebody brought somebody who was blind. And Jesus took this person apart. Jesus did something very unconventional. Right? He took some mud, he spat on it and put on the eyes of this man. And then Jesus asked him, can you see? He said, yeah, I can see. I can see people walking 
like trees. And Jesus touched him again. And the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 8, verse 25, then his eyes were opened. He could see everything clearly. Brothers and sisters, this morning I want to challenge you, challenge myself. Are we seeing things clearly? Because this is what the Holy Spirit will do. Help us to see. Some of us need a second touch from the Lord. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Every time the disciples were going to do something amazing, the Bible reads, uh, records for us, fill with the Spirit. Fill with the Spirit. Fill with the Spirit. Would you allow Him to do that? You need a second touch. You need a third touch. You need a fourth touch from the Lord. If you have been so far away, come back to Him. If you have been so far away, draw near to Him. He will draw near to you. Let's pray.